Hello and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. This is where we talk with entrepreneurs and business leaders about how they're building resilience during this very challenging moment. Uh, and my guest today is Cheryl Conti. She is the founder and CEO of Do Big Things. It's a women-led digital agency that helps organizations like Google, the NAACP and Etsy and others uh, do creative strategy, advertising, website development, and much, much more. She's also an award-winning author. Cheryl, it's great to have you. Welcome. Thanks, Guy. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, before we begin, I just want to thank NPR sponsor HubSpot for their support of this episode. With HubSpot's CRM platform, you don't have to choose between enterprise tools that are powerful or easy to use. It gives you both, so your marketing, sales, and service teams can align with ease, accelerate sales, and anticipate every customer need. Finally, there is a CRM platform that helps you run better so you can grow better without complexity ever getting in the way. You can learn more at HubSpot.com, so thank you, HubSpot. All right, Cheryl, you were part of our first ever How I Built This Summit in 2018. You came back in 2019. It's so great to have you back. Uh, with us today. And by the way, if you are uh, watching on Facebook or YouTube or uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, you can submit questions for Cheryl um, through those uh, platforms and we will try to get to as many as possible. So first, Cheryl, for those of you, uh, for those of, 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 of us watching, um, tell us a little bit more about Two Big Things. Tell us about your company. Sure, absolutely. So Do Big Things is a digital agency, as you mentioned, uh, that specializes in working with the world's leading causes, campaigns, candidates, corporations with mission-driven initiatives uh, to provide the new narrative and new tech for the new era in which we all are living in today. Uh, so, yeah, we're working really hard uh, on the election, but also on the pandemic. You know, we've been working on eviction prevention campaigns. We're likely to start working on um, an, uh, a, a campaign targeted at misinformation around vaccines. Uh, you know, we're, we're out here really trying hard you know, to, to, to help people in a tough time. And, and sort of give me a sense of, of how you how you work with companies. Like what are, I mean, campaigns, of course, and, and sort of creative marketing, strategic advice, um, things like that. Sure. People come to us for a lot of different reasons, right? You know, we are a digital full-service agency, right? So, you know, whether you need strategy, uh, you need research on online influencers and who to target where for what, uh, whether you want to run uh, ads for persuasion, uh, or for acquisition. Uh, some people, we're, we're building apps. We build uh, websites. Uh, it just depends on you need to do something online to reach someone, usually not to sell anything. You know, we're not selling things, widgets, toothpaste, cars. You know, we're, we're helping to promote positive ideas that create social change. So I know, um, Cheryl, before you uh, launched Two Big Things, you actually created a uh, another business, Attentive.ly, Attentively, um, which is a social marketing software um, business and, and, and one of the first tech startups with a, with a black female founder um, and then was acquired by a NASDAQ company. Um, so can you, can you just kind of walk us through the, the journey of, of, of that business and how it was acquired and then how you decided to start Do Big Things? Sure. Well, that's a long story of uh, how I started Attentively, but basically we saw a gap in the market. And I think especially in this time, for those people, maybe you have lost your job or your job is changing, uh, you know, things are moving around, you know, look at the gaps around you and, and see if you're able to provide a solution to that problem. And that's what we did. We saw in the corporate marketing segment that there were a lot of people using social listening, influencer engagement, and marketing automation in, in very sophisticated ways online that nonprofits didn't have access to uh, for a lot of different reasons. Price, uh, the tools weren't really tailored to the way that they talk about their audiences. So that's why we created Attentively, you know, to meet that need and fill that gap. And, you know, we had competition, of course, and, and we were very visible also, you know, as an all-female team, as, you know, with a black female co-founder, it wasn't easy to get funding. Um, we, we had to work really hard, and, and I experienced, you know, some real discrimination despite, you know, running at the same time, you know, another digital agency that was, you know, had, had pulled in millions of dollars in revenue. You know, we were still seen as, as risky, uh, which to me seemed very, very strange. 
long story short, uh, yeah, we grew over time. We became the dominant player in our market. And you know, we were an impact startup that then became acquired by an impact corporation. Um, Blackbaud, which is one of the leading purveyors of nonprofit software. And what people don't realize, Guy, is that the nonprofit sector, you know, providing goods and services, is an $800 billion a year right. sector. So, you know, th this is, you know, there it's possible to do good by doing good, and, and that's what we do here at Do Big Things and what we did at Attentively. Um, I know that you've been, um, you've written a lot about, uh, you've got a blog and you, and you, and you write for, for different publications and um, a lot about increasing diversity in entrepreneurship. Um, how, can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that, that you are trying to, 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 to push this idea out into the world? Absolutely. Well, when you look at uh, the field right now, there, there's still this socialization, you know, in, in our country, in our world that a an entrepreneur looks like Mark Zuckerberg. And no disrespect to, to Mark, but, you know, he's not the only person who's got great ideas. Entrepreneurs can come in every shade, every size, every color. Um, and that's a thing that I think we need to work hard, uh, especially now as our economy is rebooting, you know, to work on. So I wrote a book, Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success. And it's really, it's the story of my journey, but there's also a lot of friends of mine who are investors, uh, who are founders themselves. And it's their stories as well of, you know, what did it take to get through every part of the startup cycle, which is tough. I named it Mechanical Bull in part because it's a wild ride. I mean, it's a tech startup, no question, especially if you're a woman. Uh, you know, when a woman rides a mechanical bull, people have a different uh, response to that than a man. You know, when a man rides a mechanical bull, they're looking at his strength, his strategy, his stamina. When a woman is riding a mechanical a mechanical bull, you know, they're, you know, watching the jiggly parts, right? And they're not really focused on the same amount of effort, maybe more effort that it takes for a woman, that same strength, strategy, and stamina. So uh, I wrote the book to help other entrepreneurs uh, launch their their company. You know, maybe you have an idea and you're not really sure how to start, or maybe you're midway and you're struggling. You know, I did it the tough way. Okay, like having being a, in the tech world as a black woman, not easy at all. Absolutely dancing backwards in heels. Okay, uh, that said, I also am active with uh, groups like Social Venture Circle. Uh, which is all about uh, impact uh, entrepreneurship and investing. Uh, I am an advisor to Astia, which is one of the leading uh, angel uh, networks focused on uh, female entrepreneurs and startups. Uh, I'm also partnering with Impact Seat. Um, and Impact Seat uh, has actually has a focus on uh, women and women of color. They've made 60 uh, investments. And, you know, what I really like about Impact Seat um, is, you know, their philosophy, right? The key idea isn't that diversity is a social good. It is, but it's a strategy for growth. And, you know, minority-owned businesses and female-owned businesses have creative friction built into them the way they operate every day. And that's what we need in our economy now more than ever. Barbara Clark, you know, who leads Impact Seat is amazing, and that's actually a quote from her. Um. You wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review. It's called um, Advice on Launching a Tech Startup When You're Not a White Man. And it's a really terrific article. Um, and if you're following us on Twitter or, or Facebook, we'll post that um, that link to that article so people can check it out. Um, you know, one of the things you talked about was that, um, you know, when, when founders of color are pitching entrepreneurs, uh, are pitching VCs, um, they're pitching ideas that help may help their communities out but may not solve uh, uh, problems or impact the, the the lives of the rich, you know, predominantly white men who they're pitching. So, what what advice do you have for um, you know for up and coming founders and founders of color who you know to kind of demonstrate that their their big ideas are worth it, are worth backing, even if the potential funders, you know, might not be directly impacted by that product or service. Absolutely. Yeah, I do hope that people check out uh, that article because uh, we worked really closely um, with Harvard Business Review on it. 
Um, and it has a lot of practical tips in it that I think people can use right now. But yeah, you know, I think at least what worked for me was data, 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 right? And showing, look, you might not get this totally. This isn't a problem that I'm solving for you, uh, you know, wealthy, white, male, you know, investor. Uh, but there's a lot of people for whom this is an issue. And here's how much money we can make. We can do a lot of good. You know, some some investors really care about that, especially right now. But also, you know, this is a pathway to making a lot of money and creating, a, you know, a successful uh, business that, you know, builds you know, jobs. Right. You know, one of the I remember at the um, at the summit, um, you did a session about imposter syndrome, um, which I love. I love talking about because it it's such a huge um, it's it's such a huge issue for so many people, so many people, even successful people. Um, and you talked about how you, especially as a black woman in tech, you know, um, you know, dealt with it. How it can be hard to feel competent, you know, um, like you belong, um, especially when you're in a room full of you know people who look exactly, you know, who all look the same. Um, so so let's talk about this idea first. I mean, um, I'm sure you have. You know, when you when you when you talk to younger founders or younger younger entrepreneurs, people starting up, they probably confide in you that they're a little bit nervous about feeling like they they don't quote unquote belong. What do you what do you say to people when they when they talk to you about that? Sure. Well, I certainly felt that way when I first started. Uh, you know, I was definitely the the fly in the oatmeal, uh, <laughs> which in some ways I turned to an advantage, right? Because if I'm, you know, the only black woman walking into a room and there's a hundred white guys, and I'm not kidding, that has literally happened to me, yeah. uh, you know, people remember me, you know, they know who I am, you know, I stand out. And so, you know, I, in my case, I tried to, A, fake it until I could make it and say, all right, you know, I need to embody being a successful, you know, technologist. Uh, and even if I don't feel that way right now, how would I act if I were that? Um, and then it became more natural over time as I practiced and, and basically role played. It felt like role playing sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, use it as an advantage to stand out. And look, you you are as qualified as anyone there. That's what I tell people. You're as qualified. You know, just you know, bring your best to the table. And there are going to be people who don't get it, who don't want to work with you. I mean, that's the reality of the situation, unfortunately, in America today. But I personally have found the tech sector to overall be relatively welcoming, um, especially if you have you know, really strong technical skills, which are needed right now. I think one of the ways that um, you you also suggested people kind of try to tackle this or overcome imposter syndrome is to build a network. Um, so how, I mean, right now we're, 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 you know, all living in a virtual world because we're all inside for obvious reasons. Um, we're mainly inside. How do you, how, how do you, how can people build virtual networks now? What are, what are some ways they can start to, to do that? Well, especially for younger yeah. people. Wow. What an advantage you have that I didn't have in terms of, you know, coming into your career with, you know, a, a network that you can keep in touch with. Because as you get older, you know, a lot of your peers are going to have really interesting careers and, and jobs and, you know, you can help each other. But yeah, I have found that the power of a network to be the thing that has made all the difference for me. I could not have launched my businesses without my network, definitely couldn't have kept them without mm -hmm. that same network. Um, and growing it over time is really important because you are then, you know, again, that's where you're going to find your team members, your clients, your partners, opportunities to co-market together, and people who will have your back and vouch for you in spaces where, you know, you might be different than, you know, the norm. And that certainly has happened for me where I've had white peers say, hey, Cheryl's great. And you should you you should talk to her, you know, which has has sometimes made a big difference. Cheryl, um, we're getting some questions in from from viewers, um, and this one comes from Twitter from uh, Scribelite, um, and the question is, how do you authentically avoid contributing to the systems of white supremacy in in an industry as complicit as marketing in the U.S.? Question from Scribelite. That is a great question because white supremacy isn't just a white people problem it's an everybody problem right i mean you know we see it all the time um in in various ways um where people 
um, even diminish themselves or, you know, they say, oh, you know, I don't want that kind of person helping me, even if they're the same color. Um, so it's certainly something that we focus on. You know, we are diverse at um, Do Big Things. All of my businesses have been diverse. And that's not, again, just a nice to have. It's a strategy. In our case, you know, because we do marketing and engagement, you know, we believe that having a lot of different types of voices, we have people who you know, are, have a disability, you know, we have LGBTQ staff, you know, we have, uh, you know, people who live in every region of the United States, West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, South, we have, you know, people of every different ethnicity, we have people who are immigrants, you know, and people, you know, whose family like mine have been here for centuries. That's because we believe that those voices, when the content comes from those voices and they're targeting the same market, it's so much more authentic. And we try to pull in the voices of the people we're serving as much as possible. So it's not always us talking or creating the content. You know, we're finding that, you know, we're working with the people to then put those voices back um, into, into the ether. Um, we have a question from Sadie uh, from YouTube. Sadie asks, what advice do you have for women of color who want to start their own businesses, but they, they may not have the resources to get started? Yeah, there's a chance that you don't have the resources to get started and that it's going to be more difficult for you. I mean, there's no question. I mean, when you look at Digital Undivided's Project Diane report, Digital Undivided is also a nonprofit, um, you know, working on uh, impact startups or startups just in general from with women of color, only zero, a point, zero six percent of venture capital has gone to black female startups and that's out of you know billions of dollars and so yes it might take you a little bit longer to raise uh it may might take you a little bit longer to sell however however things have definitely changed uh since i first started my startup there's a lot more uh angel networks that are focused on people of color and on female entrepreneurs, you know, all especially in the wake of, you know, the racial justice uh, movement that has surged forward, um, you know, all of almost every fund that I know is really looking at, you know, how can we lean in on funding um, people of color. Uh, and look, you know, you don't have to have your own idea. You know, the good news is that there are a lot of companies that have franchises and they really want, they, they're eager to bring in people of color to run those franchises. Those, you know, the, the franchising models like UPS, for example, has, you know, uh, franchising, uh, you know, they will give you money, uh, loans, they'll give you training, you know, that you're, you're in a network. So there are lots of different ways, um, you know, to, to find that those resources, but look online. I mean, the good news is this is the power of building a network. You know, when you go to places like AngelList or uh, FS6, uh, there are, all of these great networks, even LinkedIn, you know, where there are investors who are looking for entrepreneurs and team members who may not have their own idea, but they want to get involved in a startup. And so build your team. You know, um, we've had um, in, in recent months, we've had um, some VCs on who are focusing on, on, on um, supporting women and women of color. Um, and we've, we've been hearing about even some of these big VC firms like Andreessen Horowitz, who are actively seeking to fund um, uh, businesses started by black founders. Um, is it, I mean, it, and as you point out, it's, you know, the, the environment is changing for, for fundraising for, for black entrepreneurs. But if you are, you know, a, a black founder, say, in the middle of the country, in, in, a, in a place like St. Louis or Chicago, rather than, you know, New York or, or, or the Bay Area, um, where do you start? Where do you start to kind of look around for support when you have what you think is a great idea? Absolutely. Well, you've got to reach out beyond St. Louis is what I'm saying. Uh, you, that's not to say that there aren't, you know, there's an, probably an angel network, you know, that's local in your state and you should look them up and, and seek them out. But you've got to start making relationships outside of St. Louis, for sure. That doesn't mean that you have to move your business or that you have to move. You know, that's one of if there's any bright light in the pandemic, there aren't very many. But one bright light is that where you live right now doesn't matter so much. So, you know, it's a question of, you know, how do you start to map out? OK, this is my idea. Where, who are the funds? 
who are the investors that are interested in that this kind of either manufacturing or AI or this startup or food? Because funds, VCs and angels do tend to have a focus of where they're going to put their money. They're not just looking for any startup or, you know, any black person or any woman of color or any founder. You know, they're looking for, they say, okay, you know, we want to invest in innovative startups that are focused on, you know, changing, uh, you know, data, right? They're, they're data focused or, you know, they're AI focused or they're food focused, whatever it is. So you can actually, I mean, that's the, the beauty of the internet. You can actually go out and Google and start to network, you know, again, in places like AngelList and, and find these people or LinkedIn and just talk to them. You don't be shy. I mean, look, I'm here to tell you, being shy <laughs> is not a way to be successful in business. You are going to have to be, and especially if you don't look like a traditional entrepreneur, whatever that means, you know, you're going to have to be, you know, fairly assertive and persistent. You know, one of the ways in which, you know, I was able to get that first funding was not giving up. I had to knock on an awful lot of doors, a lot of doors shut on me, but I didn't give up. And eventually I was able to find, you know, that, you know, those first couple of investors who said, this seems like a really good bet. And that's the thing. Look, here's the thing. You know, I know the world of venture capital and impact investing, you know, better than most just from direct and at times painful experience. And this is a great time to be an investor. And for a lot of different reasons, there are haves and have nots in America right now. And if you are a have, there are some excellent opportunities to both make money in the near future and invest in impact companies that aim to bring something positive into the world and solve problems. And, you know, that means doubling down if you want to bring this economy back doubling down on investing in small businesses, especially from women, especially from minorities, especially from rural areas, in innovative startups that are rising up because those are the businesses right now that are undervalued and are going to overperform. You know, Cheryl, I, I, I know that you're aware of this, but um, in general, entrepreneurship has been in decline in the U.S. since the 70s, right? There were more, and, and, and particularly among um, among black entrepreneurs, like there were more black owned banks in the seventies and more black owned insurance agencies in the seventies. Um, what's your kind of prognosis for where we're headed? I mean, with all of this, um, you know, talk of, of, of investing in, in black and brown owned, um, founded companies and, 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 you know, more and more conversations around it. I mean, do you, th do, are, do you think that it's, going to move the needle significantly that in 10 years time we will see a massive you know gr massive growth in the number of, of big businesses or, or startups founded by people of color I think that's already happening I, I think that's that's already a, a trend and you know people are finding now wow I really can work from home I can work from home I can set my own hours I, I can you know make that difference in my life. Uh, where I have a family-friendly life, but also I am doing great work. You know, and that's because, you know, our our economy has been turned upside down. And people are going to have to be very creative about, you know, how they rebuild their lives, their careers. And I think that the, the government clearly, at least in the last stimulus, and I think probably in the next stimulus, is wanting to support small businesses. Small businesses are the foundation. Something like 70% of jobs ultimately are still in small businesses. Yes, there has been consolidation, um, you know, just because big business, you know, right. just the, the way that the prior economy, you know, was moving, you know, was in, in you know, pooling things together. Uh, but I think that all of that has been scrambled. The egg is scrambled. Right. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity right now. And I think that you'll find that local governments, state governments, the, the federal government is actually going to put a lot of resources into helping small businesses. And that's by necessity going to have to include minority owned businesses. Um, one last question um, from the audience. This is uh, from Tom via LinkedIn. Tom asks, um, Tom says, we want more diversity at our company. Um, how do we strategically market to minorities to get them interested in working for us? Ah, that is a really great question. Good for you. Yeah, you know, I read a statistic that uh, something like 70 to 75 percent of white people don't actually know another person of color, which I find to be a baffling statistic. I'm not really sure how that works in, in America, but 
you know, I get it that, you know, you're trying to reach outside your network and you're not really sure how to start. And I think acknowledging that is important. Uh, you know, it happens to me all the time where colleagues reach out to me and say, who do you know, Cheryl? Can you connect me? You know, so figure out who in your network you've got to know hopefully at least some black and brown people. And if you don't know them personally, look them up on LinkedIn, you know, start to look in your field, start to read articles, right. You know, in your field and figure out, okay, who are the leaders who also happen to be black or Latinx or Asian American, reach out to them, even if you don't know them and just say, Hey, I love your work. I think you're great. I'd love to get to know you. And Hey, we're also hiring. You know, actually, you know, you're going to have to do a little more work. You're going to have to get out of your bubble, right, and and really reach out. Now, there's also lots of venues where you can reach out. You know, there's Black Enterprise Magazine. You know, there are, of course, shows, you know, that you can advertise on. Um, you know, there are uh, blogs. You know, there are online influencers you can look up. They're all, they're, you know, but it does require taking that step of doing some research to figure out who are the leaders, who are the players, and how can we start to reach out to them to help us recruit. Shell Conti, Do Big Things, thank you so much. Thank you. So great having you. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. A couple quick announcements before we go. Uh, next week on the series, we're going to have Justin Gold, the founder of Justin's uh, uh, Nut Butters, and you probably know maybe his peanut butter cups are great. Um, check out your podcast feed. Our most recent episode uh, dropped on Monday. It is a two-part episode. It's the first time we've done a two-part episode. It's about McBride Sisters Collection. Amazing story of two sisters who were separated at birth and connected as adults and created now one of the biggest black-owned wine businesses in the world. It is an incredible story. If you haven't listened to part one, drop everything after this and go listen. It will it will change your life. I'm serious. It's amazing. Um, also, if you um, haven't had a chance to check out my new book, it's out, How I Built This, out in bookstores, wherever you get books. Check it out. If you love this show, you will love the book. Uh, and check out Cheryl's book, too. Cheryl, hold it up. Check out Mechanical Bull, too, sold wherever books are sold. Um, the other day, Cheryl, I walked into a, a bookstore, and I saw my book in there, and I just secretly signed it, and then I I put it back on the shelf. So you should try doing that too. <laughs> Maybe I will. That sounds yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you back here uh, next week. Uh, Cheryl, thank you again. Thank you, Guy. This has been great. Bye, everybody. <laughs>